Seriously, I started to uh, contemplate the possibility of uh, studying art with my teacher, uh, el profesor de, art, de artes plásticas en, en Lima, en Perú. He invited me to his studio, you know, his atelier. And uh, at that time he was doing a portrait. And I really liked uh, the fact that I was in the middle of this kind of, uh, you know, beautiful space with the easel, the, the colors, and the, the painting in process. So I was impressed by all that and it was really fixated in my mind. And I said, probably I would have to come back. So that was the first introduction to what a studio was. I was 14. Well, I guess I started a little late, but in any event, I do record that when I was smaller than that, uh, six, seven, eight years old, uh -huh. I used to illustrate my, my books, you know, my copy books with images, with color, without the teacher telling me. So uh, I guess that was uh, an early index that I really like uh, painting. Yes, in a way, because I like, I like the atmosphere, the, you know, the colors. The idea, the dedication, and and the fact that the teacher was very patient with me, and so I, I like that, that that space. So somehow it, it you know called my attention to that world. I guess my sensibility for color, for different uh, yeah. shapes, or the space was such that it, it get an impression on me. Wow, that's amazing! Because yeah. ultimately, you you are now in you know a full time artist. I am. <laughs> yeah, soon after that, let's see. Uh, what at seventeen, I applied for the School of Fine Arts, you know, for the exams, and uh, I did very well. So I was accepted. So I started the process of uh, at that time. I think there were in total six years to study art. First, I finished four years of uh, for being a teacher. I got my degree as a professor of plastic arts. So in other words, I was able to teach and uh, you know find a job if I wanted to. I, I taught for two years in Lima. You and see, my students were about my age. Some of them, I was 21 or 22. So it was an interesting experience. And wow. then I remember in 1972, I was participating in many uh, competitions, you know, artistic ones, and even some biennial in Colombia, representing Peru. So I was doing really well, you know, the, as soon as I uh, was a, a graduate from, from fine school in, in, in Lima. I remember some students who, who were open to, you know, to have a sort of a dialogue between the teacher and the student talking about art and possibilities going, for instance, to a gallery, to a museum, or get involved with uh, things like, uh, you know, brushes, colors, books, you know, those kind of things. So it, it was very interesting, I think, for them and for me, because I was learning as well from them, you see. Yes. It was my first experience as a teacher, and what it means to be a teacher, sort of, a, in this case, a guide, to uh, you know, to somebody who is sensitive, who wants to express him or herself. So uh, that was very interesting, but only for two years because after that, I applied for a fellowship to go to England. It was in '72, so I was able to to win it, and uh, there I went, studied for well, stayed in Europe for almost three years, yeah, basically in London and Cardiff in Wales. For the first time, I was lucky enough to take a plane <laughs> to cross the Atlantic and land in Europe. And uh, it was quite an experience. Go to the main capitals of Europe, you know, like Rome. I went to Paris, Madrid. I went to uh, Germany, Nuremberg. I visited the house of Albert Dürer, one of my heroes. Yeah, I can see that interesting picture of me pointing a painting in process that was in Cardiff. Yeah, on top of that, there is a, this is very interesting because uh, 
yeah, that face, you know, that detail of the face within the, the frame is a replica of a famous painting by Van Dyck or Van Dyck, Flemish painter. So I took it from books and then from the real painting at the National Gallery in London. So I did my own composition. You see, I, I combined my elements dur during those years, which, uh, which were kind of surreal, with the straightforward reality of a portrait by a master. And that is the result. Oh, absolutely, yes. Otherwise, just would be a replica. But I didn't, you know, it was the, the so-called appropriation of an image into my own work. Right. And I did that in oils. Depends on where the difficulty could be. Is in the interpretation and in the nuance and the expression of it, or how you assimilate the, the, you know, the main source, which is the work by the master, and the fusion that this could be done with your own interpretation. Right. And how do you express it technically? So it, it is not always easy, you see. It depends as well on the technique. If this is a small work, it's, if, it, if it's a work on paper, canvas, wood, or panel, or just a drawing. Right. I remember doing some works on paper that, that they are on the website that, that they find, I find them very appealing to even nowadays because, you know, I was, I think, 26 or 25 when I did those. And there are small pieces like this, you know, like a, you know, page. And uh, I did a replica of Rembrandt, one of his self portraits, but in the middle of, of my own creations, you know, in, in black and white. And the result is very pleasing, at least to me. Van Rijn, the, the Dutch painter, some master. So there, there he is. I wanted to do my own interpretation you know, in the surreal sort of metaphysical world, but him in the middle, in miniature. And all this is done in black and white with graphite and uh, hard pencils, like 3H, 4H, 7H, which are the hardest. Right. And with a few pieces of, you know, softer pencils, but everything in black and white. Very, to me, very, very appealing, very mysterious. It's a medium, you know, a channel for, for the right. artist to express himself. Right. Yeah, paying homage and respect to, to them. You know, trying to maintain a certain uh, umbilical core, you see, of beauty and respect and, you know, capable to, to express something really unusual and powerful. So that, that was the purpose, you know, admiring Rembrandt like I do admire Leonardo, Michelangelo, Van Eyck, Van Dyck, Rembrandt, of course, and Dürer among them. So those are my, my leaders, my, my guys, my masters. Well, needless to say, these experiences allow us human beings to get a better perception of the world, you know, a more personal vision of what our purpose is here on earth. And in the future, try to leave a legacy of what we have done when we were alive. Right. I guess we live only once, so, uh, you know, uh, I think it's very important for us to leave something positive, an imprint to our country, to our relatives, to our friends, or the big names, big, na big men who, who did the proper in the past and somehow try to make some history, you know, in a very humble and dignified way, but, you know, the sky is the limit. We, we, we have to pursue it and we have only one chance to do it while we are alive and conscious. I guess the closest aim is to sort of leave an example, you know, to, to, my, to my own people, to people from Peru and South America, 
Spanish speaking uh, people who are part of this world, you know, and try to do their own in the best possible way by, by doing something, I guess, exemplar, you know, yeah. clear, on, direct, and, and serious. So that way, we continue with the, the walking in, in, in this world as, as, as artists. That's, that's how I see it. There is a painter by the name of Carlos Bacaflor. He, he was, he's a very, very interesting personality. You see, he was, he studied in Chile first when he was, uh, let's see, between 12 and 21. His parents were born in Moyendo in Tarequipa and uh, they, they wanted him to go to Chile because he was close anyway to, to study art. His mother saw in him very good qualities, you see, as an artist. So they decided to take him there, finish his studies for six years. At the very end, the, the Chilean authority, you know, the, the faculty, uh, chose him chose him as the, the main student. And they were going to give him a purse to go to Rome to oh, wow. pursue his career and study there. But with one condition, they said, so Mr. Rocaflor, you are an excellent student. You, you have been given this prize, but we request one thing from you. And of course he asked, what is it? Well, you will have to acquire the Chilean citizenship. Oh. You have to be a Chilean to get it, to honor it. And Bacatol said, no, thank you. I am Peruvian. I, I cannot accept it. I accept it. So what he did is came down to the floor because he was, you know, three steps where the where these people were. And, and he left because it was important for him to keep his nationality. So the president of Peru then, I think it was uh, Andres Averino Cáceres, I think. He heard about it and he said, well, wow, amazing, this is, we have to do something about this gentleman because he has proven that he's a real Peruvian. So we have to do something to equalize that and uh, tell him to come to Lima and try the best way to equalize that or even better the price. So he could go to Rome and pursue his career. So he had to wait for three years in Lima because you know how the bureaucracy is in our countries. So finally he went to Rome. I think he stayed there for what, two or three years. And one of his friends there recommended him to go to Paris. So he stayed in Paris for a few years. He excelled as a portrait painter until one day, I think it was in, let's see, 1910. This famous personality in America, a very important financier and art collector. His name was Pierpont Morgan, the founder of the Morgan Trust, you know, benefactor, he has donated all the best paintings from all masters to the museums in America, like the Freaks, like the Heavy Mayors, the Melons, the, the Cresses of the World for the Berenson's. Anyway, uh, Morgan had a friend in Paris who was a fashion designer. He, he made his suits to Mr. Morgan. So Mr. Morgan went to the studio of the uh, Modista, we say Modisto, I don't know how you say it in English. A tailor, a designer? Mm, well, somebody who does very good suits. A very respected tailor in Paris. He was a friend of Pierre Paul Morgan. But something had happened recently. The super tailor asked Mr. Bagaflor, the Peruvian, to do a portrait of him. 
So he did this fabulous portrait and he was there in his studio, I mean, in his office. So when Morgan came and I saw this portrait and he said, wow, who did this? He captured you. Could you tell me the name? Oh, of course, Mr. Morgan. This is Monsieur Bacaflor, the Peruvian. Wow. <laughs> I want to know him. Show me. Where can I see him? I want him to paint me because nobody has done it. Only pictures in black and white. Mr. Morgan decided to visit the painter without any appointment. So he went to the house, locked the door, and said, Mr. Bacaflor, yes, that's me. How can I help you? Well, my name is Pierre Morgan. Do you know who I am? No, I don't know who you are. What do you want? How can I help you? Well, uh, I am a very busy man. I saw the portrait of the, what you did of, of my friend and uh, I, I would like you to paint my portrait. He said, fine, Mr. Morgan. So when do you want to come? He said, no, you will have to come to New York because I'm a busy man. I will pay you whatever it is, but you have to do it in New York. And he said, no. So they were sort of, you know, discussing that. Finally, Mr. Morgan won. He took Bacaflor to New York. He stayed in New York, I think for almost 20 years. Unbelievable. You know why? Because Mr. Morgan introduced Bacaflor to all la crema y nata de la sociedad neoyorquina en cuestiones de, you know, religious, judicial, financiers, right. businessmen, law authorities. So he did portraits of, of, of the New York society in those years. So the first portrait that he did of Morgan. And you know what? Mr. Morgan decided to do 10 replicas of that portrait. And one of them is at the Metropolitan Museum. The other one is at uh, Morgan Chase collection in downtown. The other one that I know is at the Morgan Library. So the other seven, I don't know where they are, but there exists 10 replicas of that famous portrait of Mr. Morgan painted by Carlos Bacaflor, the Peruvian. So with this, I was trying to tell you how interesting is the life and travails of citizens of the world, but some of them pass away without notice because we don't want to hear anything. We are so immersed in our own work and the officials, the, you know, the, the authorities in the different countries, forget us. They don't care about them because they are in their own perimeter, right? So it, maybe it's not our fault, but it, somebody has to be responsible about getting to know who is who. Look, Juan Diego Flores, I'm so proud of him. This is our best letter of introduction to the world, like Mr. Mario Vargas Llosa. And then Baca Flor now, Cesar Vallejo. I mean, if we talk about Cesar Vallejo, it's unbelievable how important this man was. But he didn't get the Nobel Prize like Pablo Neruda did. But there are scholars who say that, I'm sorry to say, you see, the poetry and the, and the content of the works by Vallejo are of a different nature, completely an entire caliber that has nothing to do with the work of Mr. Neruda, being him a splendid writer that he is. Right. Why? Because the channels of function were different. Mr. Vallejo was kind of really personal, you know, fond, retired, heavy duty involved with politics, while Mr. Neruda was a diplomat as well. He was an ambassador from Chile in Paris okay. in his lifetime, I mean, at the best of his lifetime. So I guess he had more access, right, to, to be seen, to be heard, to be understood, right. to convey 
for him to convey his ideas and people reacted accordingly. So, but anyway, artistically, going back to Juan Diego Flores, he had to leave Peru in order to pursue his career. Right. First, he went to Philadelphia to the Curtis Institute. Then he went to uh, Julia, uh, Juilliard here in New York. Amazing. After all that, he went to Milan because he was invited by his countryman, Mr. Palacios, who as well was an opera singer, but now he, he's his uh, coach. So Mr. Palacios told him, Diego, I think you should stay in Europe and Milan would be ideal for you because he's close to all the big houses in Europe, you know, Scala to uh, Covent Garden in London, Mm -hmm. You name it, all over the world. And that's what he does. And who wins? The Peruvians. Because the image of an artist from Peru is there, clear and knitted for, for history. He's recording with the best houses in the world, among them, the, the Germany, the Germans, uh, what is it? Deca, yeah, Deca. Deca is recording his best productions. Juan Diego Flores. And how old is he? Uh, I think he's 47 or 48, married, two children, but wow. he had to live. And now they say that probably he's among the three most important tenors in the world. If you were in Lima, sorry to say, that was not going to happen. This is what is my answer to your question. In in that how we artists try to lead or leave our own print, our own trace in the world. We have to keep trying. And if we are in good health, we never stop learning. No books, you know, the books, I mean, th this is, beautiful to be able to choose you know to, to see to react to browse and decide that i feel happier with this in my collection for instance you see you're proud of it it's an extension of you it is like what cicero the roman said a room without books is like a body without a soul and that is so deep and this makes you happy because you are part of it an extension you, you see the binding of the book, you know what it is because you project yourself into it and you are creating already, you know, united forces and different mm -hmm. avenues for you to meet if you have that, you know, that essential is, capacity that, you have to recognize what could be possible. And a book gives you that, even, even the smell of it, the weight, the, the, the color, the, the, you know, that's why the, the this, people who, who have access to first editions or to incunabula or collector's items, you see, and they're proud of that. They, they, these are their babies, you know? It's like, instead of collecting a painting, they, they, they collect books, bibliomates, and it, 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 it's a beauty, you know? London, when, when I was in London, my goodness, I saw the Wallace collection in, uh, in the center of London, West One. I was there, going almost every weekend to see the collection of paintings, but go to the book, to the library where the books are. You know, me as a Latino, Peruvian, have the luxury to, to really you know, be aware of that and enjoy. So when I came to London, I went to the morning and I see almost the same concept, you see, the design, the architecture, the books, the, the program, the education, uh, possibilities of, of, of that from a different house. It's like a petite uh, Victorian Albert Museum or, or the Louvre or, or the Frick Collection, you know, all in New York. But I could see clearly the influence that the English had among us, you see, especially in the concept of museums and libraries. And that is really, you know, a luxury, really uh, amazing to, to see that how powerful culture is. I agree, absolutely, yes.
because we have to be, you know, uh, witness of what is going on, on around us. Try to express it, in this case, as a painter on a bidimensional surface. And uh, the conveyance of ideas, possibilities, color, style, fashion, technique, which takes a long time, you know, we, we, we're always learning. Nothing remains the same. Life is so organic, it's so full of energy. So accordingly, the idea is even better because, you know, the influx of ideas from uh, Schopenhauer to Mario Vargas Llosa or from uh, Hippocrates, who said, by the way, this famous adagio or tenet that pita brevis art longa. What does it mean? Life is short and art is forever. And yeah. it's, it's true. It is true. And he was a, a physician, so-called the father of all the physicians. Therefore, the famous oath of, 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 the, of the doctors. And it's an art, you know, the art of curing, the medicine. They had to, well, some of them were, well, the, the, you see the famous, the monks, the, 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 the medieval sages who were a bit of everything, inventors, artists, writers, thinkers, philosophers, like St. Thomas of Aquinas, you know, a theologian, a philosopher dealing with art and reality like uh, Plato did, or Ficino in, uh, in, in the Renaissance in, in Firenze, Italy. You know, when, when we read and we compare, we analyze, we, we try to understand how the world works, you see? Right. Make ideas. What, what is reality, you see? Representation. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, proud and you know to accomplish uh, the standards uh, for for them to to choose me as a as a winner, and to be given a diploma that enabled me to you see to in this case to teach, because without it, even here you know in America, if you don't have a degree, you cannot perform your your best. Right. That's why you see many doctors from Argentina, from Peru, from South America. They could be excellent uh, doctors, but they cannot exercise the, the, their, their, their tools here because they don't have the degree necessary to prove that you are qualified, even more so than, than the others who have the credentials. You have to follow up you know, a rule uh, of, of the, uh, the principles of the different uh, governments. So yes, uh, when, I, when I finish, I, yes, but I said, well, this is, this is just the beginning because I'm young and uh, I, I want to try different lines. So I, I went to, to the British Council and applied for this fellowship. I won it and I went to England, to London. I traveled all over Europe, visiting museums firsthand, you know. I never thought that that could be done so fast for me because I wanted first to pursue my career as a painter in Lima, you know, exhibiting, gaining prizes, mm -hmm. getting important collections, being in museums and all that. But I said no. I am. I want to. I want to try other, other, other latitudes. You see, that that's why I went to Europe. Then came back to Peru for three years in order to leave again. I won the Fulbright, and I came with that fellowship to Pratt Institute to continue. And but then it was a decision. I'm staying here, and this is what I'm doing. I always wanted to come to New York. Yes. You see, yeah. because New York nowadays is Mecca, something like uh, Paris was in the 50s. So it's, it's very interesting to be witness of that when you are in, at your prime, you know, to, to really enjoy, analyze and, and study the conditions of what does it mean to, to live in a country like uh, United States in New York, could be Chicago, Boston, Los Angeles, which is about the same, but nothing compares to New York. You know, as a as a as a land of challenge, you know, opportunities. I prefer to be a citizen of the world, be anywhere, you know. So yeah, sure. I mean, those experiences being in Europe, witnessing all the man, the, the culture, the customs, the food, everything related to what it is, the essentials of each country in Europe and go back, come back to America and re revisit Latin America, 
it gives you a better vision of what the world is, you know? It, it knocks your door about what to do with all this richness within you. Yeah. And if you have the means to express yourself, that's, that's it. That's the name of the game, you know, to be able to convey all these resources, all these energies in order to express yourself. And as I said, leave something for the future, you know? And that's, that's a, a beautiful challenge that we have to fulfill somehow, you know? With good health and predisposition, why not? We are enjoying life. I think that, that's, that's a real enjoyment of life. We cry, we laugh, we walk, we dream, we, we sleep. Dreaming and sleeping is not the same, you know? Yes, all those experiences, I think, will have a resonance in your work uh, as an artist, be it movies, design, architecture, painting, yeah. writing, even singing, you know, because you learn from, you, you, you take the best and you filter it, you, you make a, a un alambique, no, fundamental de lo que está pasando en el mundo, yes. and you take it for you the best and you cherish it, you ponder it, you are proud of it and you, you give it away, but with, with a very, very eloquent and mature, sophisticated way of, of expression. So people can really value, treasure it and feel good about it. A page of a book that can say many things, many ideas, emotions, right. no exchange of ideas, being proud of it, just with one, you know, printed image of something that we like and respect. You know, to create a dialogue, to do something energetic about creativity, you know, in life. Of course, we have to find somehow a peer, somebody who understands us, you know. It's a little more difficult if we try to educate or convey the ideas into some somebody that is not interested yet, you know. So the requirement is a certain level of understanding so we can connect, you see, exchange ideas. And if we do that, I think it would be less conflict in the world, right? It would be more peaceful, more creative, more authentic, more honest, and not that, uh, you know, uh, demeaning. Very difficult to classify my work, you know, even myself, because I could co call myself a surreal painter, but I'm not, you see, because if not everything is done subconsciously or by intuition. Because I like some confrontation with with something concrete like reality, you know, uh, limits, borders, shape, proportion, symmetry, that implicitly conveys a certain order of things in reality for us humans to to behave and con live our lives. So something of that part has to be included in the in the world at large. So I guess it's a symbiosis between, you know, the the the, the the intuition and the rationalism in my work. But the result being a result of the two, the blending of the two. So could this be called metaphysical, probably? Metaphysical painting, metaphysical representational painter. That sounds close, if I had to say about it, if I had to mention some, uh, you know, uh, ID. That, I think better than that is, is the role of, uh, of, of the so-called connoisseur, you know, the, not the art dealer, but the scholar, you see, the curator, the museum director who can really organize himself or herself and try to include that particular painter into something that is happening, you see, regardless of time, because the Nazarenes, for instance, in Germany, they were emulating painters from years past, like the Pre-Raphaelites in uh, 19th century England, under the baton of John Roskin. You know, there were these painters gathering around him because he was the great guru, the wizard, yeah. saying that everything before Rafael Sancio was the best in art. Now it's just a variety, it's not important. So if you want to belong to this movement, come, come to us, come to me. So the movement called Pre-Raphaelites Pre was created. You know, that the Rossetti, 
William Paul Manhan, uh, uh, Albert, what is his name? Uh, Millet, it's not Millet, the French, M-I-L-L-A-I-S, who, uh, 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 who was the leader of his workshop for designing, for painting, for architecture, you know, that they believe in, in this movement. I think I, I answered that question, which was uh, very, very, very interesting, because sooner or later it was coming, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, you're a unique individual, you know. You're it's the you know? best compliment I've been told uh, after an interview. Okay, I wanted before we end. Now let me be the interviewer. Oh no! Why, with all my respect, that a be beautiful name of yours. Why? You change Victoria to Tori, and indeed. Wow, <laughs> okay. Yes, Vicky, I mean, what indeed. The what do you mean? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to be so aggressive. But no, how it's okay. My name is Victoria, right? I love my name. Yes. Tori was more of an identity where, you know, whatever job or employment I had, I can keep it separate or my life. I love my name, yes. Victoria. So, indeed, just amplifies that I am Victoria. Indeed, like I am, I am me. You know, I am true to myself. Of course, I am. Yeah. So that's why I chose the Beautiful. word "indeed" because it, you that's know, a very, I, very, very kind of Latin American, serious, elegant sense of humor. There, you know, a little touch. Indeed, <laughs> you know, English. Latin America, Peruvian, I think, Peruvian, some, something of, of the Peruvians in the, in the good quality sense of humor related to your name, to your artistic name. And that, that's why I like it, you see. But I wanted to hear from your lips. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias también. Que le vaya muy bien.